From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Welcome to the special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Lauren Clark, and thanks for joining us. The Cronkite School is proud to house the Donald W. Reynolds Center for Business Journalism. It provides a training ground and resources for our reporters covering money, trade, and industry worldwide. Tonight, a look back at some of our top Cronkite news stories of the year on The Money Beat. The number of minority-owned businesses is growing and even outpacing those not owned by minorities. That's according to the U.S. Census Bureau's most recent survey of business owners. The Native American population still lags, but a new program is helping to get entrepreneurs spinning in the right direction. Gregory and Jonah Hill are twins, entrepreneurs, and on a mission. I want to be a hermit and just, just stay in a little room and just fill it with tops. Do shows outside of Arizona is one big step. The Flagstaff-based top maker and silversmith are Hopi Kwachan. From the village of Kikuts movie, um, Fitbungwa, Tapbungwa, which is tobacco and rabbit clan. They grew up on the reservation and like other natives are using their traditions to make a living. But it hasn't come easy. Native American-owned businesses make up only 3% of all minority-owned firms in the U.S. What the challenge is, is adapting those ways to fit with modern society and modern ways of doing business in America. A struggle for most. A lot of people who are small business people that I know who are Native have a pretty hard time because they're not really used to interacting with a larger audience. Adrian with the Native American Business Incubator Network is working to grow the community of Native business owners. We saw a need and we decided, hey, we're going to address it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to find a solution. They're connecting Native entrepreneurs, a critical tool for the emerging businesses. It would be nice if I had a lot of different connections, someone to kind of point me in the direction that I would like to go. That direction may be as clear as the direction these tops spin. I think my twin brother is my biggest my biggest mentor. The Native American Business Incubator also helps Natives whose businesses are based on the reservation. The struggle there is a completely different one because of the bureaucratic process and the difficulty securing loans and capital. If you have a small business plan you want to finance, you may just be the right person that two Arizona agencies are targeting. Cronkite News reporter Devin Conley reached out to see how they can bring your business to life. The Arizona Technology Council teamed up with Arizona Collaboratory Inc. to bring, bring, bring big solutions to small businesses. They've created a portal to help match entrepreneurs with people who could provide money for their ideas. When Andrew Chaffetz created his startup business, Nopal, he said one thing was particularly hard. It's a big challenge for, for entrepreneurs trying to get funds, especially in the Phoenix area, it could be a pretty big challenge. Two agencies are trying to change that. The Arizona Technology Council has paired with the Arizona Collaborate Inc. to bring together local businesses and investors to create a site that matches them up. It's a very exciting time for small companies. Uh, there will be huge opportunities to, um, to have access to, to new investors and, and new capital and um, we're very excited about Arizona being a, a leading player in that particular market. This portal is strictly limited to state residents in an attempt to help grow Arizona's digital finance, according to the Arizona Technology Council. Businesses can register online to become a tech member. From there, they can gain access to experts and advisors. According to Arizona Collaborative Inc., the purpose of this portal is to take small Arizona businesses and, and help, help them grow. grow. And local companies like the idea. And it's uh, very good for um, these types of companies to have options when they're looking for resources and those types of things. Uh, the education aspect of it is going to be really great for businesses that are looking to start. I think that's where the market's headed. And so I think it's great that Arizona and Phoenix is uh, trying to be able to promote investors to be able to invest in startup companies and be able to help. The portal now has a soft launch website, but will officially open at the end of the year. In the Broadcast Center, I'm Devin Conley, Cronkite News. The Phoenix Symphony is back, but they never really left. Cronkite News reporter Jennifer Souls has details on how the group pulled through tough economic times. This season is a big one for the symphony. They're playing Beethoven, performing Harry Potter-themed Halloween shows, and bringing in big names like Kristen Chenoweth. But these all seemed like distant dreams during the recession when budget issues plagued the organization. As Arizona's largest performing arts organization, the Phoenix Symphony makes a lot of sound. 
but 2008 and 2009 brought severe challenges to the organization. The symphony was about a week away from bankruptcy. Um, the symphony was spending too much money for what it was taking in. Before Ward took over, musicians took a 19 percent pay cut and were promised a restoration payment the following summer. That did not happen. And our musicians fundamentally had a very, very uh, tough choice. They could go along with somebody brand new coming onto the scene or they could have decided to walk. Phoenix Symphony starts planning their future seasons two to three years in advance. But they coordinate with Symphony Hall up to five years in advance, something that in 2008 seemed like an impossible feat. Ward started fresh. He established a new board and a new mission and prepared his staff for the challenges ahead. There have been a lot of ups and downs. The positive thing I can say is the Phoenix Symphony has kept going through all of these. Musicians account for about 50% of the overhead in any symphony, but for many in Phoenix, music came first. They decided to put the needs of this community before their own needs to keep music alive in Phoenix. In the four years since the turnaround process began in late 2010, overall revenue has increased by 74 percent and attendance is up 25 percent. Seasons are planned so far in advance because they have to share hall space with both opera and ballet productions. In the Broadcast Center, Jennifer Souls, Cronkite News. With 10 days until Halloween and just a, a little more than a month to plan for that Thanksgiving meal, chances are a shopping trip for pumpkins in, is in your future. Cronkite News reporter Mitch Casada has the details on why Arizonans are getting a sweeter deal on prices. Pumpkins, pumpkins, and more pumpkins. At Mother Nature's farm in Gilbert, October means pumpkin season. I grow all of my pumpkins, so I have really good price control on what I have. But this year, the national average cost for a pumpkin has increased 33 cents over last year. Arizona is one of the only states not affected by the hike. Why? Throughout the Southwest, especially in Arizona, most of the pumpkin patches and a lot of the stores buy locally. Not so for the rest of the country. 90% of the nation's pumpkins are grown in Illinois, one of the area's hardest hit by a drought across the Midwest. How much is a pumpkin going to cost you this season? Well, a small one like this is probably going to cost about $3. Ugh. But a big one like this is going to cost closer to 15 Compared to the national trend of more expensive pumpkins, that's a steal. Pumpkins in Arizona are grown in Arizona. Make sure you look for Arizona grown. It makes them a better pumpkin, I think. In Gilbert, Mitch Casada, Cronkite News. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the average price of one pumpkin costs $4.35 this week. But that's a 10% increase from $3.95 pumpkins cost last week. Arizona has seen no price fluctuation. For Valley residents buying home, mortgage rates are very attractive, but most millennials have yet to push past the renting phase. Cronkite News reporter Devin Conley is here with more on what could be a change in attitude. Rents are high and mortgages are still low, but young adults haven't been buying houses. Now there are signs that this could be changing. For 23-year-old Natalie Mullen, the thought of buying a house is miles away. It's not worth it to me. I'd rather pay rent and save up for a house that I want to be in for a long time. This millennial reflects the attitude of many in her generation. And with the Phoenix housing market recovering more slowly than after past recessions, experts say 21 to 34-year-olds share the responsibility. Partly it's that millennials have been reluctant to buy homes. And there appears to be uh, evidence now that that's beginning to change. Consider a recent Realtor.com study which found 65% of millennials researched real estate websites and apps in August. And for good reason. Zillow shows renters in the Phoenix area can spend up to 28% of their monthly income on housing. Meanwhile, homeowners are only spending around 17%. While millennials may be researching home ownership, some are still skeptical to make the commitment. If I was going to pay a 30-year mortgage, I want it to be in a house that I want to be in for 30 years or longer. You're going to have to have a lot of money saved up in order to get deposits, you get the loan, you get a house. Real estate groups are encouraging more millennials to not only search for property, but to buy. Otherwise, rental rates will continue to climb. Um, rental rates are definitely significantly higher year over year for like the last three years because there's so many people going into the rentals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
According to Zillow, interest rates are hovering at an all-time low since 1985. In the Media Center, Devin Conley, Cronkite News. Mortgage rates in Arizona have hit some record lows this month, but some families still need some extra help to get that new home. Cronkite News reporter Julia Thatcher takes a look at one program offering extra assistance. American dream, owning your own home, and now more families have the possibility of being homeowners thanks to a program available right here in Maricopa County. Earlier today, Phoenix and Maricopa County officials announced an expansion of their Home in Five program to include teachers and first responders. The program provides a 5% grant for the loan's amount for those who qualify. Those advocating for the program say they hope to give back to members of the community who are truly deserving. People that have committed themselves to public service um, financially uh, are rewarded for doing so. We want them to, to feel that stability that all of us that are blessed with home ownership have the opportunity to do. The program targets veterans, low income and moderate income families, and today, teachers, firefighters and police officers. To date, over 7,600 families have purchased their homes through this program. It started in September of 2012, and of those individuals, 90% were first-time homebuyers. For Karan Hardiman, who bought his home through the program in December of 2014, he said the process of applying was easy and took less than 30 days to close on his house. But it was about much more than just buying a home. It gave him a sense of belonging. But I feel now that I'm part of the community. Right. Uh, no offense to any renters, you know, but when you are a homeowner in a community that you feel like this is where you want to live your life and I want to build and live this American dream, I think that's so much so important. The program is only available in Maricopa County. The money comes from lenders and goes towards down payments and closing costs. Being able to have somebody give me that down payment um, really eased me in the process for being a first time homeowner. <laughs> To find out if you're eligible, contact Phoenix Industrial Development Authority at phoenixida.com. In the Broadcast Center, Julia Thatcher, Cronkite News. The multi-billion dollar marijuana industry found a home in Arizona this week with the Southwest Cannabis Conference take, taking place in downtown Phoenix. With 300 booths exhibiting all types of marijuana operations, job seekers were quick to get in on the action. Walk into the Southwest Cannabis Conference and the first thing you see is a Volkswagen blowing out smoke. But the people are here for business, like Liberty Wester, a culinary student hoping to find a job. Um, I've been picking up a lot of business cards from different dispensaries in the area that make a lot of chocolates and stuff like that because I'd like to be a chocolatier. She's looking for jobs specifically in Arizona, knowing that job prospects are slimmer here because our state doesn't allow recreational use. It's a little more difficult to think about even trying to be a cannabis chef because it's it's specific product and like that product isn't legal. But the pot industry continues to grow even in medical marijuana states like Arizona. Whether it goes adult use or even if it stays medical cannabis, people are still opening up more businesses to service collectives, to service dispensaries. But the marijuana job market doesn't limit itself to growers and dispensaries who work directly with the product. Hector Santa Cruz with THC Jobs, a cannabis staffing company, says jobs supplementing the industry make up a larger part of the job market. 70% of the jobs that we have in this industry are all these ancillary businesses, whether it's um, marketing companies, branding companies, packaging companies. But the competitive market isn't stopping Liberty. I've always wanted to be a chef and it just seems like the right idea to try to help people while doing what I love too. If she doesn't get the sweet job offer she's looking for, the aspiring chocolatier says she's moving to Colorado. The Southwest Cannabis Conference wraps up this evening after a job fair on Monday and a series of lectures catered to anyone doing anything in the cannabis industry. Fall leaves can inspire hikers around Arizona to head north and witness the natural beauty. But this season, the leaves aren't changing color because of the weather. Conkite News reporter Aaron Johnson traveled up north to find how the change may be affecting Arizona tourism. Aaron? Even though there is a loss in fall colors this season, district rangers do not believe that it will impact their economy. Normally around this time of year, trees up in northern Arizona have changed to reds, oranges and yellows. But rangers say due to the warmer, rainier and windier weather this fall, the leaves haven't been able to change. The Sedona Chamber of Commerce said regardless of the leaf colors, Sedona continues to be busy and hikers have come from out of state to enjoy the scenery. Sedona is beautiful. Dale Bush came from California to get away from the traffic. 
and enjoy the nature that Arizona had to offer, but says she would have liked to see the changing fall leaves. The holiday season, it's very, very special. It brings back memories of childhood. So that would kind of be missing and there would be no difference or no a sense of a physical change, it would certainly be beautiful to see. The Arizona Office of Tourism collected data on how much money visitors spent in Coconino and Yavapai counties. Hiking trails fall under arts, entertainment and recreational activities, which has increased in both counties over the last eight years. Here on Bell Rock Pathway outside of Oak Creek Canyon, you can see there's not a whole lot of variation in leaf color. And up in higher elevation on the way to Flagstaff, there doesn't appear to be much of a difference. Rangers said they have received a few phone calls asking about the leaves in the area and have described to visitors what they believe is the reason the leaves aren't changing color. You know, we've had a really wet fall. Uh, we've had a lot of windy days and what that does is it makes the colors turn, the leaves turn really fast, but then they fall off the trees really fast too. But park rangers say there may still be a change in the next couple of weeks. It all depends on the weather. If we get a nice cold snap, that'll make the leaves that are still there um, turn really quickly. To find some of the best places for fall leaves and hiking in Arizona, visit the U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service page online. Live in downtown Phoenix, Aaron Johnson, Cronkite News. Yesterday's storm in Flagstaff brought record-breaking snow, according to the National Weather Service in Flagstaff. They received about 10 inches. Our Cronkite News reporter Lauren Michaels explains how all the snow will affect tourism this wintry season. Here in Flagstaff, they did have a significant amount of snowfall to start their season, and many residents here are starting to prepare for the tourists arriving, especially this year's Snow Bowl and all the surrounding businesses. Snow, snow, and more snow. Flagstaff has transformed into a winter wonderland. And Missy Heal, a local business owner who has worked at this restaurant for 26 years, is ready to see more tourists. You can definitely tell around town that it's busier. Um, it seems like if it snows on the weekends, we're not as busy as when it snows on the weekdays. And that could be because of Flagstaff's winter attractions, like the Arizona Snow Bowl. This year, they have invested $2 million, installing a new chairlift on Humphreys Peak and expanding infrastructure to allow snowmaking on Ridge Trail, giving skiers a chance to be on the trail all season this year. But can they quickly make this revenue back? We don't necessarily count our successes in revenue dollars. Uh, it's really in skier count. And in a year like this, you can see anywhere from 175 to 200,000 visitors or even sometimes more. He looks forward to meeting those winter travelers and keeping up with the Flagstaff locals. I love the people here. I, I moved away for a little bit and it just wasn't the same. And she could see bigger crowds with this year's forecast calling for a strong El Nino. More snow than normal is expected. To see this kind of weather come in this early in the season just gets us super jazzed. This is the stuff we live for. This year's weather patterns due to El Nino has brought Flagstaff more rain than usual. And because of that, the Arizona Snow Bowl will be opening a few days earlier on November 20th. Here in Flagstaff, I'm Lauren Michaels, Cronkite News. Following the success of the Super Bowl, Phoenix is now slated to host two more sports mega events. Cronkite News reporter Rebecca Wynn found out how these big games can boost the Valley's economy. Phoenix has been selected to host the 2016 College Football Playoff National Championship game. And for the first time ever, they'll be hosting the final four games in 2017. But the Valley is expecting a higher return than some other host cities around the country. The final four games are returning to the West Coast for the first time in 20 years and will be hosted in the Valley for the first time ever. That not only means new visitors to the area, but those visitors will also have more time to spend at local restaurants and businesses. Because of, um, you know, our time zone, the games will actually be over earlier and so fans will spill back out and go out and eat and go to bars and, and just, you know, the nightlife I think will be larger on Saturday than normal at, um, in other cities. So that just means that people are, are out spending more of their disposable income uh, here in the Valley. Brad Wright, the co-chair of the Arizona Organizing Committee for the 2016 College Football Playoff National Championship game, said their focus is also on creating a sustainable funding source for all of these mega events. So our committee is focused on both the immediate economic impact from this game, but long-term residual economic impact for years to come. 
The last four BCS National Championship games that Phoenix hosted, the city saw an additional $642 million. With the upcoming college football playoff national championship game, as well as the final four being hosted here, they hope to not only see that number increase, but also the overall economic impact on the city increase. The goals are, are, are multifold. Um, one is that we're able to um, connect with local businesses and help drive um, their business and show some return to them. Um, and the second is just an opportunity to highlight Arizona and strengthen our economy. Um, w as we saw with the Super Bowl, we had um, companies that we were able to secure um, to come here to the Valley and um, move to the region. So it's just definitely an e a way to spur economic development for the region. Phoenix will be the first city ever to host the Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, College Football Playoff National Championship game, and the Final Four in consecutive years. In Phoenix, Rebecca Wynn, Cronkite News. If you were a kid in the 80s or 90s, you can probably remember playing Nintendo games on your NES or Nintendo 64. Well, just because you sold your games or your console doesn't mean they're not still out there and being played. I visited a couple video game stores in the Valley to find out where these games are now and just how much they're worth. Ian is reliving what he calls the glory days. Let's just go for the bounce ball. Like all the other games that I play, like Super Nintendo and N64, it's definitely just, you know, it brings back all the memories and stuff from playing with all my buddies, um, coming over to my house after school. But 23-year-old is at the younger end of a particular niche of gamers who prefer the classics. Um, nostalgia is huge as people are like, oh, I remember playing that. I'm like, I remember playing, getting the whistles in Super Mario Brothers 3. To start all over. They don't mind the clunky controllers, pixel graphics, or even the high price tags. For $380, you can play this Nintendo game. Bubble Bobble Part 2 made its debut in 1993. It's cost then $70. A recent purchase I just made, it was just for a single cartridge. It cost me around 150 bucks just for that single cartridge. So who's driving the comeback? A guy said a pretty funny line to me once. He said that he, he feels that he's a, still a kid, but with money now, so he's trying to get all his games back. And he's right. It. Research analysts that watch the game industry say baby boomers coming of age are causing the increase in demand. Games that were only a few bucks to five to fifteen dollars are now twenty, thirty, forty, fifty dollar games, easy. And People pick them up and they're willing to, to, to pay the money in. But for fanatics like Ian, Damn, a DI. Right. the price tag will never matter. It, it's just, it's really special to me. It's, it's just like kind of, it's right here. Research analyst Michael Pachter told us the nostalgic culture will keep the games around because as long as someone who played those games is still alive, they'll want to play them again. Earlier this year, the city of Tucson got approval to host a college football bowl game. And today, that title sponsor for that game was revealed. The Nova Home Loans Arizona Bowl will be held December 29th, featuring teams from the Mountain West Conference and Conference USA. In 2014, the International Spa Association released the improvements of the industry since the recession. Now, Devin Conley tells us how Arizona's businesses are reflecting these results. It's the sound of peace and tranquility as you enter. And inside, the mood shows. The Fuchsia Spa in Mesa expanded their business in 2012 by doubling the size of their store. Now, they're entering into a new phase of growth by franchising. It's always been a goal of ours to expand Fuchsia. We've just been trying to wait for the right timing and to make sure we had um, our ducks in a row, so to speak. And Fuchsia isn't alone. According to the U.S. Spa Industry Study, the popularity of massages, facials, and pedicures continues to rise. The industry has grown 5% between 2012 and 2013, resulting in a $14.7 billion in revenue, numbers that make Fuchsia confident in their decision to expand. We basically tripled in size, too, over the last couple years, and our numbers continue to grow. I'm very confident in going into the marketplace. The industry also continues to see growth in almost all areas of the study, including a 2.5% increase in both spa visits and revenue per visit. Right now, we're about 10% higher than we were last year, and our goal next year is to be at 15%. So we're definitely seeing a trend. Monica Kinney, an avid spa user, notices the change. I'm using it more now than I ever had um, before, and I would say like within the last five years, I'm like, oh, you can go to a spa, it is affordable. 
Fuchsia will be one of the estimated 20,100 spas located across the U.S. In Phoenix, Devin Conley, Cronkite News. Fuchsia will be opening their new branch here in Phoenix next month. Americans are expected to spend $4.9 billion on Halloween this year. Costume shops, candy makers, and haunted houses will compete to get their piece of the pie. Cronkite News reporter Steve Dent found a local business that's using the undead to bring in customers. Who is the enemy? The infected undead. Four nights a week, Scarizona's Chris Prendergast takes customers on a wild ride, acting as Corporal Robinson. Now, I don't know what you think you know, what you might have heard, but zombies are real. They've taken over this part of the valley. Our mission this evening is to seek out and destroy the enemy. Light them up, light them up! Operation Zombie Storm is underway as we get closer to Halloween. Customers get to shoot 200 rounds of paintballs at live zombies. Scarizona aims their business model at millennials, knowing the National Retail Association expects 82% of people ages 18 to 34 will celebrate Halloween this year. We want them to have fun. And that's the age group now that's really into the haunted house. Haunted houses are coming back into vogue. It's fun pe for people to be able to go to them now. Haley Pleasant visited as a group bonding experience for employees working at Mad Dog Saloon. I thought it was really fun. I liked that it was really big and they had all the different little scenes and stuff. So I thought it was really fun. As for Prendergast, he never once broke character. You just might make it out of this situation alive. In Mesa, Steve Dent, Cronkite News. That's it for the special edition of Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.